Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, or early good evening. Thank you for attending uh, this afternoon, early evening. I'm Linda Goff, and I'm president of the New Mexico Jewish Historical Society. And I wanna welcome all of you who are from uh, throughout the state here in New Mexico, our friends and colleagues from the Texas Jewish Historical Society uh, and others beyond. Um, so then let me uh, in, give a brief introduction to Justin Ferrate. A number of you here this evening um, have heard Justin speak for us, uh, the Catskills, the Jewish Catskills, parts one and two, Jewish Harlem, et cetera. Many of you know him and uh, he graciously uh, puts together one speaker program for us each year. And we are delighted to have you back. Um, Justin is an urban historian. Um, he also uh, was uh, the tour uh, lead guide for the Gray Lines in New York and wrote the uh, entrance exam for authorized Gray Line tour operators and has received many uh, recognitions uh, from uh, well-known people in New York City and in New York State. He also is very involved in the art world here in Santa Fe. Um, I also like to refer to him as uh, our Renaissance man. He is a walking encyclopedia <laughs> in so many ways. Um, so then with, uh, as they say, with no further ado, let me hand it over to Justin Ferrate. Okay, thank you. So welcome, welcome to this evening. Thank you to Ron and Linda for uh, nudging me to, to create this program. This program has a special meaning for me, and hopefully by the end of it, it will have a special meaning for you as well. Um, before we continue, we do have some words from our sponsors. Uh, for those of you who are looking for a memorable holiday gift, I highly recommend purchasing multiple versions of the secret Jewish space laser. 50% uh, of the profits from this one, one 400 scale model of the authentic secret Jewish space laser go to defeating Meshuggah QAnon supporters who are running for Congress. This is for real. I'm not making this up. It's available on Etsy and many other sources on the internet. Just go type in secret Jewish space laser and you can bring some home for your friends. This is also true. This is from today's journal and uh, a rather sobering message from the Anti-Defamation League. This was published today. And this is just a small sampling of 2021 American white supremacist propaganda sheets. Just look at, these are all individual sheets and I assure you, these are not all of them. So this is the thought I want to begin with. So here's what I look like for those who can't see me. My name is Justin Ferrate and uh, uh, we're going to be visiting the, the history of Jacob Schiff. Um, Linda has been nudging very rightfully so. Is it, how long is it going to be? I don't know. I created this just for you. Um, so I can't tell you. I've never done this lecture before. Uh, it will be a little longer perhaps than many, but uh, hopefully not too long. I'll try to keep things moving. I will include a break midway so you can rush out and, you know, get something to drink or, or you know, run around the block or something. So um, well, let us begin with Jacob Schiff. So new. Uh, who, who is Jacob Schiff? Many people have never heard of him, or people who have know, well, he's sort of famous, but they're not really quite certain why. So Jacob Henry Schiff, or Jakob Heinrich Schiff, was born in 1847 in the city-state 
of Frankfurt am Main. Uh, Frankfurt am Main, Main means the Main River. The town is on the Main River. It's a separate city state. Think of it as like Nevada, or actually in today's news, the state of Texas that wants to become an independent nation. That was Frankfurt. Frankfurt was an independent entity uh, and would not become part of the newly invented nation of Germany until 1871. Now, people were often interchangeably use the word German, and uh, it's not quite accurate, so it clarifies. In any case, he was born in 1847, and he died in 1920. So Jacob Henry Schiff was often viewed as the preeminent leader of American Jewry at the turn of the century. He was the number one guy. And so we have a quotation here uh, from, I'm going to get rid of that. Okay. Uh, from from the Sefer Mishle. Sefer Mishle is from the Ketuvim. This is the 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 KH of Tanakh, um, and these are often referred to as the Proverbs. And actually, we'll talk about how that name came about because part of that happens to do with Jacob Schiff. Do not withhold good from the one who needs it when you have the power in your hand to do it. Jacob Schiff truly lived. By this, by this premise. So, so the American financier Jacob Schiff was the most prominent German Jewish businessman of his era. The Schiff era was from 1880 to 1920. He was a titan in the world of inner. I failed to tell you one thing. In my notes, um, uh, what I didn't say is that there is a fair amount of script. This is not your job to read it, okay? Part of it is because computers vary from individual computer to individual computer. So uh, the sound may not be good on your computer or you may misunderstand something or you may not know how to spell something. That's mainly why it's there. Frankly, it also helps me remind me of what I want to speak about. So in any case, Jacob Schiff was a titan, a leader of the community, but very importantly, it was an outspoken voice against anti-Semitism. And to this very day, Jacob Schiff is noted for being the greatest financial backer of Jewish causes in the history of the United States. His benefactions would transform the nation, both in terms of Jewish causes, Jewish organizations, but also non-Jewish organizations. Many institutions were founded and were financed by Jacob Schiff, and they continue today to enrich both the Jewish and the secular landscapes of the nation. Uh, Jacob Schiff was incredibly generous, and his interests were incredibly varied. I mean, one of the things that was hard about putting this talk together was, like, where do I stop? He keeps going. Um, but it, the endeavors that he supported were education, social betterment for, for Jewish Americans, uh, women, African Americans, the deaf, unskilled workers, believe it or not, juvenile delinquents, because until Jacob Schiff, no one addressed what became a somewhat problematic issue for the Jewish community. And very importantly, and probably what he's most famous for, for advocating for the persecuted Jews in Eastern Europe. So today's talk is going to address a number of issues, but I want the one overwhelming hover that throughout his life, Jacob Schiff was an observant Jew, and this would color everything he did. Now, some basic topics for tonight, European Judaism, both anti-Semitism and pro-Semitism. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to please all hit the mute button on your on your computer. Um, so uh, we're going to address centuries on the Judengas. Judengas is the Jewish ghetto in the town of Frankfurt am Main, and uh, then Jacob Schiff as the new American. He became an American citizen very soon after arriving, and he would remain a proud American throughout his life. So. How did Jacob Schiff make his money? Well, that's a very important question. And it also enabled him to be able to fulfill his mission as a Jew. Because as an observant Jew, Jacob Schiff strove to fulfill tikkun olam, his personal covenant with God of how to heal the world. 
So what are some of the legacies of Jacob Schiff? We'll delve into that subject as we travel on. But first, a little bit of history. During the Middle Ages, throughout most of Europe, Jews were consistently denied citizenship and civil rights. That means somebody does something to you, ain't nothing you can do. They were barred from holding posts in the government and the military, and they were excluded from membership in guilds and professions. Okay, so what's the big deal here? You couldn't practice a profession unless you were part of one of the guilds. So uh, many, many jobs just were not available to Jews. At various times in Europe, entire Jewish communities would be expelled from kingdoms and city-states, sometimes for hundreds of years. One of the classic stories is that Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, wrote The Merchant of Venice, and William Shakespeare could not physically have ever met a living, breathing Jew in his lifetime because Jews were expelled from England throughout the entire time of his life. No Jews were allowed in England at the time. William Shakespeare never actually met a Jew. So think of that the next time you see yet another production of The Merchant of Venice. Now, very important to our story in a strange way is that the Roman Catholic Church, which ruled all of Europe, was part of the Holy Roman Empire, required that all Jews in Europe wear distinctively Jewish clothes, hats, and other identifying agents, simply to differentiate the Jews from those good, noble Christian citizens. Now, one of the identifiers was the medieval star, which was invented by and for the Roman Catholic Church, and then was revived by the Nazis in the 20th century. So remember, while we see that yellow star, we think of Nazi Germany, remember, we also have to remember the Holy Roman Empire in the medieval times. On the left-hand side, we see two images of, of the most common Jew hat, and that's what they were called, Jew hats. And you'll see these sort of, uh, they're actually called horned hats, uh, but uh, very classic. There are lots of different things. That's just, that's only one thing. Uh, you were not allowed to wear certain things, certain uh, fabrics were not allowed to Jews, certain kinds of uh, uh, things for making leather for shoes or all of the restrict requirements. Here in Yiddish, uh, if you want to spend a little time reading the Yiddish, is a history of Jewish hats from different periods of time. And all of these understand are to underscore the fact that these are not hats worn by Gentiles. These are hats that were strictly legally required for Jews as part of the Jewish ensemble. So importantly, while socially and culturally marginalized, Jews in some cases were viewed as very necessary by the Christian community because pre-modern Christianity did not permit money lending for interest. Money lending for interest, according to the laws of Christianity, is called usury, and usury means any kind of interest, any kind. So can't charge interest, who's going to lend money? How many of you would lend your fortune to some guy down the street and say, yeah, pay me back when you're ready. Yeah, you don't need to give me anything extra. The point is the Jews could lend money and could charge interest. And Let's face it, if you want to raise an army, if you're a nobleman, if you want to protect your, protect your lands, if you want to uh, invest in a new building project, you need money. You need money quick. If any of you ever bought a house, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have to raise money. So that's sort of the function of the money lender. So that, then hence from this would come a very stereotypic role of the Jewish banker and the Jewish peddler. And I just want to say, Think of your own experience with bankers. When was the last time you wrote a wonderful fuzzy love note to your banker? Uh, bankers tend not to be well loved no matter whether they're good to you or not good to you. So as the European commerce grew in the late Middle Ages, some Jews became very important, very prominent in trade and banking and in money lending. And this made people rather envious. And so because of this, in many 
many, many European cities and states. And remember, when we talk of Europe, we're not talking countries, we're talking cities and states, remember, within what is now a nation. The idea of nationhood is a 19th century invention. So the, the idea that we are a nation uh, is not a typical idea for most of European history. They're individual city states or their provinces or their properties owned by a particular ruler. In 1096, Christian knights from the First Crusade unleashed a tremendous wave of anti-Semitic violence in France and, and in the Holy Roman Empire. And when they were on their way to Jerusalem to, uh, to kill the Muslims, and I live in Santa Fe, so I guarantee you almost every church in Santa Fe has a picture of San, uh, 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 San Sebastian, no, no, I'm sorry, it's, uh, uh, why am I blanking on his name? Um, uh, the, the, the Christian saint who, St. James, St. James Santiago, uh, who was, according to Spanish tradition, came back to save the Spaniards from those evil, evil Muslims who ruled Spain. So in every Roman Catholic church in New Mexico, you will find a figure on the altar of Santiago, this Christian saint, who was one of the saints at the famous Last Supper, killing Muslims. So it's all part of the, the history. Now, the thing is that just to practice, I guess, the, the Christian knights killed thousands of Jews, thousands of Jews. The blood shed in the Rhine River Valley was tremendous. Now, if you look to the left, you'll see an image of this, and it's sort of underscores it, maybe unintentionally. Here you can see these knights who are wearing crowns, uh, killing Jews. And notice the Jew hats. These men are wearing Jew hats. And here we can see two Christian saints blessing these knights, killing the Jews. And even better, up on the top, floating in heaven, there is Jesus giving blessings on the killing of the Jews. This is a trope that has lived for thousands of years and one that had tremendous influence on Jacob Schiff. Now, there's some good news for the Jews. After all those Jews being killed, uh, the Kingdom of Poland was founded in 1025 and then later would merge with the, with the country of Lithuania, creating the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1569. These two nations were the two European states that were the most tolerant of Jews. In fact, during the 14th century, the city of Vilna was created by the new capital uh, as the new capital city of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And the Grand Duke wanted to populate this empty capital. Many of you who saw the talk that was given on Salonika, that great Jewish city in, in what is now Greece, um, it's the same story. The reason all those Jews ended up there is after the Jews were forced out of Spain in 1492. The Ottoman Emperor said, hey, we've had bad wars. These cities are empty. You want to come and fill them up? And that's exactly what happened. It's the same story. So the Jews were wooed to Lithuania, and the Jews were treated well. And so, in fact, Vilna became known as the Jerusalem of Lithuania because of its tremendous base of knowledge. All of the great Jewish scholars and rabbis would converge there. By the turn of the 20th century, roughly half of the city of Vilna, which was about 76,000 people, were Jews. And these are mostly Ashkenazim. And for those of you who know the Passover is coming up soon, one of the things you may have on your Seder table will be horseradish, and you'll say, but my family came from the Ukraine. And, and the answer to the question, why is there horseradish? Because horseradish is German. It is not Slavic. It is not from Russia. It's not from Ukraine. It's not from Poland. It is from Germany. And what happened is that that tradition of the horseradish got carried with them. People like that horseradish a lot, don't want to lose the horseradish. So over the centuries, Poland and Lithuania would become havens for thousands and thousands of Jews who are persecuted and expelled from various European countries. So the waves of immigration basically were defined by where people were being evicted and 
the, the citizens of both Poland and Lithuania invited the Jews home. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth would become the world's largest Jewish community at the time. At the top, we see the seal of Poland, and on the bottom, this is the seal of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Well, that's all really good, but here we look here and see all these images here. Here we see Lithuania. We can see the people who are traveling from Lithuania, the people who are traveling from Germany, people who are traveling from Austria, people who are traveling from Hungary and from Crimea into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth for safety, for freedom, for the ability to live. And so this is where they live. And one of the things that you're going to see throughout my talk is how many echoes you're going to see in tonight's talk that you will see on the six o'clock news where you're watching the six o'clock news tonight. So in 1795, remember that's the year that, that, that the United States would come into real existence. In 1795, after the partitions of the former Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the total dissolution, those countries would be destroyed. They don't exist anymore. The resident Jews immediately became subject to three emperors or three ruling powers that took over that property. It's a huge piece of property. So what happened is the Russian Empire got a huge chunk of it. The Kingdom of Prussia took a piece of it and the Habsburg monarchy took part of it as well. The Habsburg uh, or the Austrian-Hungarian community. One thing I do want to point out, and it's something that many of you realize, even if you don't realize you realize it, is that virtually all the royal houses of Europe were intermarried. They all were related to each other, which caused great problems, for example, in England, when England went to war with Germany, because the English throne is related to, <coughs> to the German, uh, uh, German nobility. So with the 1795 partitions of the former Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Commonwealth, Russia, whose symbol you see here, the double-headed eagle of Russia, and there is St. George the Dragon Slayer, um, suddenly inherited the world's largest Jewish population. So here is a country with a dilemma, because remember, there were no Jews in Russia. Russia had almost entirely successfully evicted all the Jews. There was a handful of Jews in the entire country, which, as you know, covers thousands and thousands of acres. Now, among the countless restrictions with what do you do with these Jews is the Russian Jews immediately were told you cannot own land, you cannot practice a profession or craft. Now, these are people who under the Polish uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth were able to own land, were able to have a craft, were able to go to school, were able to become citizens, but none of that applied. All of that was lost. So unlike other European nations, in addition to all of this, Jewish men were required by law to serve in the Russian army. No other European nation allowed Jews. In Russia, they said, come on, Jews, because at the age of 12, every young Jewish male is going to have to go in for six years of military training. Upon graduation at 18, they will then be required by law to serve in the Imperial Russian Army for an additional 25 years. Think about the numbers, look at that and realize that basically most of the life of every Jewish male under the Russian government would have been spent in the Russian army. Now, that's not enough just because we don't want those nasty Jews contaminating those good Christian citizens. Catherine the Great established a line called the Pale of Settlement. The Pale of Settlement defined where you could live, where you could work, or where you could travel. And very importantly, Jews were rarely, if ever, permitted to live beyond the Pale. That's where the phrase comes from, beyond the pale. You've probably used it a thousand times. That's where it comes from. The pale means fence or enclosure. It was the enclosure that kept in the Jews. The Jews were held hostage within the pale. And by 1897, 5 million Jews lived 
within the restricted confines of the Pale of the Settlement. So here is an image of the Pale of Settlement. I apologize if the red arrows look a little confusing, but they're mostly just to keep your eye on the borderline. Here is the borderline of, I'm sorry, the Pale of Settlement. And this is on this side, good Christians, on this side, those Jews. And so if you look closely at the map, you're going to start realizing you'll see a lot of the names that are appearing on your six o'clock news as, I, as I'm giving this presentation. So from 1881 until he died in 1894, the Russian emperor Alexander III escalated. I mean, it wasn't enough that Catherine the Great had done all this. He added more. There are extra taxes, extra penalties for Jews. Jews are expected to pay sir, uh, amounts. Remember, these are poverty-stricken people who are not allowed in most working professions. So, you know, and let's face it, the ownership of land means your family isn't going to starve. But the thing is, the Russian Orthodox Church, which is, remember, there's no separation between church and state. The Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church was, uh, there are proclamations to this effect, assigned the duty to resolve the Jewish problem. And the solutions were to be one of three, one third conversion of these Jews to Christianity, one third would be to force the Jews out of the country and one third starvation. Now, how do you starve somebody? Well, what you may be reading in the news lately is that Ukraine suffered a tremendous starvation under, under Stalin. Some of you may be familiar with the Irish hungers. The Irish hungers, the people were, were bringing home bumper crops for the British landlords of Ireland, and the Irish themselves were starving because the only thing they were permitted to eat was potatoes, because there was a potato uh, 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 blight that killed the potatoes. There was nothing for the people to eat. Meanwhile, the British landlord said, we want more, we want more, we want more. What people don't think about when they talk about the great hungers of Ireland was the fact that at that time, England was definitely not hungry because all of his food was coming from Ireland. The same thing happened during Stalin and the Ukraine. What happened is that Stalin took all the wheat and shipped it out of the country, but there was no wheat left for the, this, the people of Ukraine. If you're a Jewish farmer under Russian rule, you don't have land. So what happens when times are tough? Now, in 1882, there are even more laws added to the collection, the May laws, which further circumscribed the, the lives of the, the Jews. And then to add to all of this, there was a whole series of pogroms. Pogrom is a disaster. It, it, it is the equivalent in meaning to the Holocaust. It is virtually the same concept the same function, the pogroms would sweep across the Russian Empire for a, new, for a number of decades, for about 50 years. So Russian, anti, Russian leaders would encourage these. They thought, this is great because, you know, our country's falling apart. We really don't want anyone to pay attention to it. So it's not unlike a certain political party today that actually has no agenda other than to do in the other political party. And and so if you look at, at what was going on, the Russian leaders didn't have an answer to the problems that were happening in Russia. And so instead they said, blame the problems on the Jews. To get help, the Russian Orthodox Church, which was financially supported by the Tsar, was virulently anti-Semitic and the priests frequently preached anti-Jewish sermons to their congregations. They stood up in the pulpits and said, bad Jews, bad Jews, bad Jews, now go out and get them. And it was not a coincidence that many, if not most, of the organized pogroms or slaughters of the Jews took place during Christian holidays. And almost 3 million Jews fled Russia between 1880 and 1920. That's a 40-year period. Mostly these people ended up going to two places, either the United States 
or to Palestine. Palestine is part of what was then the Ottoman Empire. And today, Palestine, which is a Roman name for that region, would, uh, is now known as the State of Israel. So just to add fuel to our already blazing fire, we have the Russian, Russian throne developing this bit of claptrap. The protocols of the learned elders of Zion is absolutely bogus and incredibly powerful anti-Semitic text. This book purported to describe the Jewish plan for global domination, stirred up tremendous animosity toward the Jews and anti-violence, anti-Jewish violence was encouraged by both the church and the government. I do want to point out in the United States, Henry Ford, by this time, beyond a shadow of a doubt, it had been proven this book is bogus. And Henry Ford published over half a million copies of this bogus conspiracy theory text and was required any salesman who sold a Ford automobile to give a copy of the protocols of the learned elders of Zion to their patient. Every Ford dealership in this country was used as a distributorship for this book. It is the second most published book in the world, second only to the Bible. Let me repeat that because it's a powerful thing to remember. The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, this conspiracy text that undoubtedly is, be is believed by our Jewish space laser woman, is the second most published book on the planet Earth. Go look at the internet. You'll actually see various versions on the internet. Now, Jews were legally required within the pale to live in shtetlach, or in English, we often say shtetls, which were poor, dominantly Jewish village. There were Christians in the village, uh, because remember, the villages weren't owned by Jews, they were owned by Russian noble people, noble men as a rule. And um, since Jews were not allowed to own the property, they were, in essence, the personal property. This idea of Jews being the personal property of runs throughout hundreds of years of European history. Remember the reason for the Spanish steps in, in Rome is because the Jews who lived in the bottom of the Spanish church were the personal property of the Pope. The Jew owned the Popes, and, uh, Popes owned the Jews rather. And, and you'll find that true in, in towns where there, was a, where there was a shtetl, that town of people belonged to the, the ruler of the town. One of the most famous towns, of course, the famous shtetl is Anatevka, which we know from Fiddler on the Roof by Sholem Aleichem, uh, is from a, a wonderful, wonderful series of short stories he wrote called Tevya the Dairyman. The series is quite funny. At one point, Tevya has five daughters, and he has seven daughters, and he has three daughters. You never can figure out how many daughters he has. What's interesting is that it became Fiddler on the Roof, and here's our Fiddler dancing on the roof of, of one of the uh, buildings in this, this shtetl in, in the Pale. But what's interesting is that comes from Mark Chagall. It doesn't come from, from uh, Shalom Aleichem. Mark Chagall often showed these people sort of fiddling, uh, sort of enjoy in the contrast to disaster. And disaster really was for many people, the name of the game. The word pogrom comes from the Russian word to destroy, to wreak havoc, to demolish violently. The term first was used to refer to outbreaks by non-Jewish mobs in the empire from 1881 to 1884. These pogroms were often sponsored by the Roman Catholic, Roman or Russian Orthodox Church, and or by the agents of the Tsar. Horrendous pogroms continued until after the World War II. So it's, it's no pogroms did not necessarily just go away one day. Now it's because of these pogroms that the Eastern European often came to the United States. I mean, let's face it, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the United States. There still is a lot of anti-Semitism in the United States, but in general, anti-Semitism is not displayed as violently as the anti-Semitism in the Russian empire. And to these 
new Americans who were seeking a new life, a new world. This was called the Golden Medina, the Golden Land. And so here we see an image here, this wonderful New Year's card. Here we see the Americans all dressed in Western clothes, welcoming their Russian relatives. Here we see the shield of the United States and the shield of Russia. So the tremendous weight of this history of anti-Semitism would tremendously influence Jewish, uh, Jacob Schiff throughout his lifetime. And he would dedicate his life to challenging anti-Semitism, particularly as it played out in the lives of Eastern European Jews. Anti-Semitism was a word that was first invented in 1897. It's interesting how many words would put, sort of put voice to a concept that are now we take for second nature, but we forget that they were invented. And the thing is, when you have a word, then the idea becomes more real. So anti-Semitism was actually invented in 1897 by a German philosopher named Wilhelm Marr, uh, and he used it specifically to denote the hatred of Jews. Now, if you took the word apart, anti-Semitism, of course, that would include other Semitic people, such as the Arabs and other communities who are Semitic, but that's not what it refers to. It's very intentionally was created to refer to Jews and specifically for the opposition to Jews. There is a counter word called pro-Semitism, and that was what you saw being displayed in Poland and in Lithuania. Thank you very much. Justin, thank you so much for a wonderful program tonight, and have a good evening. Good night. Thank you all very, very much. Mm -hmm.